two series of webinars exploring legal and ethical concerns for student journalists. And as we said last time, there can be no topic important and more sensitive than how to cover the burgeoning stories of sexual assault in American society. PLC has had a long history of supporting and defending the student press in the United States. Founded in 1974, we're the only organization providing free legal help to student journalists and their advisors on issues related to censorship, copyright, digital rights, freedom of information, and accessing public records, which is what we're going to be talking about today. If you haven't already, make sure that you check out the first Me Too webinar, which covered the basics of verification, defamation, liability, and more um, on how to report about um, sexual assault cases. We heard from leaders of Indiana University student newspaper, the Indiana Daily Student, talking about their experiences of reporting for a full year on sexual assault on their campus. Leading up to today's webinar, um, we did a poll on Twitter and we asked student journalists about using public records to report on sexual assault. Unsurprisingly, there's a lot of confusion about open records. We're gonna talk about public records and we're gonna be answering your questions about what kind of records you can look for, where to request them, and what to do if you run into problems. We're gonna also show you a lot of resources on the SPLC website, starting with our public records letter generator to help you in crafting your records requests. We have three parts of our discussion today. We're gonna to hear from students from the University of Kansas about their struggle and their success with accessing public records for their reporting. Mike Heaston, SPLC's Senior Legal Counsel, will talk about some of the legal struggle, struggles involved, and, and we're very um, privileged also to have Daniel Carter with us to talk about Title IX, the Cleary Act, and FERPA. So without further ado, I want to invite Connor Mitchell, the Editor-in-Chief of the University Daily Kansan, and Darby Van Houten, the News Editor of the University Daily Kansan as, as well, to join us so that we can talk about their experiences in reporting on these issues. So if you, there you are. Hi. Hi, how are you? How are you? We're great, how are you? Good, Good. thanks for having us. there in Kansas? We are so happy to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of your experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started reporting on sexual misconduct after I went to a press conference from a father of a daughter who said that KU did not handle her rape report adequately. So that led me to file some records requests about how long it took KU to investigate all of the reports that their office had gotten. And then that story morphed into more requests and how the universities inform the general public about sexual misconduct. So that's my level of reporting in this and Darby can talk about hers. Yeah, and then uh, kind of in the like the last semester, I picked up an open records request that our last editor-in-chief, Laura Cordy, made. Uh, it was about the all the sanctions levied uh, against students in 2016 in relation to the student code of conduct. And when I picked it up, I saw that there was uh, like nine cases of sexual assault. And at the same time that we got that, we also, the Jane Cleary Act came out, which reports crime statistics on every campus. And uh, it showed the number of like 13 uh, for rapes that had occurred or been reported on campus property. And so I open records requested the university in general on where those rapes originated, like where the reports originated at and what happened with them in terms of litigation, if any and um, ended up only getting a small amount and have since then been trying and having mostly failures up to this point in terms of um, openness and transparency with the university and tracking down like the other nine. So it sounds like, you know, you guys have been very diligent in trying to pursue these records. Can you tell us where kind of the time and resources that you spent and then also where your frustrations were and how you had to get creative about it. Yeah, I would say the biggest frustration, I can I think that he agrees because we talk about it a lot and we've kind of talked to other people about it, um, is just the laws that Kansas has in terms of open records. And uh, I know it's the same with a lot of states, is that it leaves a lot up to the, like, uh, the discrepancy of the university and anybody that's um, receiving those open records to kind of say no in many aspects or else charge insane, insane amounts of money that um, especially student newspapers can't afford. 
I know that the sanction data that I received that um, the previous editor-in-chief got was upwards of $300. Um, and obviously, that's hard for a student newspaper, and it took a lot of time to get. And I know that Connor's been charged even more amounts of money. Yeah, I mean, the two requests that led to the published story that I think is linked in the article about this is those ended up costing around $560. And I've since filed another request that they they asked for over a thousand and then agreed to waive half of it. So it was still another $528. I ended up having to crowdsource the funding for that one. Wow. Yeah. So, so like, how do you deal with that? Like, first of all, it sounds like you were able to negotiate the fee down. You were able to come up with some kind of creative ways to raise the money to be able to pay for it. Can you, can I mean, that's, like, what happens when, when they come back and they say, Oh, you know, sure. We'll give it to you, but it's a thousand dollars. What do you do? Especially as a student journalist, you have to get creative. I mean, you have right. to you have to start GoFundMe campaigns. You have to get the public interested in the records that you want because you have to tell them how it's relevant to them and and get the interest up as much as you can. That's I think the biggest advice I have is that just get creative. Don't let don't let universities and agencies use cost prohibitive measures to stop getting records. Yeah, and like any way, uh, agency, especially university, tries to stop you. I would say like, don't let it like discourage you. I know that that's been one of another thing that frustrates me, as well as like talking to my reporters and stuff when they feel discouraged. Is the university kind of, especially in these open records, before they got to the point where they're like, okay, well, we might be able to give you something after you pay us a thousand dollars. They said. Um, we're going to have to re like they sent us emails and responses saying we have to reconsider or we're going to have to look at the scope of your request just so they can keep prolonging it so that especially in student newspapers uh, the turnover is like every semester and they're kind of I think hoping, hoping that, that we go away basically. yeah or that the data we forget about it or that we graduate and it can't be found and to not let that stop you either because uh, I think they think that student journalists especially are kind of naive and don't have the skills or resources um, and just showing that you do care and that you know the things you're talking about um, proves to be really helpful. So Darby, you picked up on nine, you said, I think, records requests that you were following up on or there were more than that, right? Yeah. There, how did, how yeah. did you make sure that, that they didn't get lost in the shuffle? How did you make sure that, you know, you didn't just go away? And it was, I guess, like the initial ones I requested, they only gave me four and they said the other nine are in their jurisdiction and it'd be up to me to find, basically. Um, and I guess just you have to read into the things that they give you and look at, uh, like not give up. Although it's hard, especially for student journalists because we have classes and a lot of times other jobs um, and don't have as much time as maybe practicing journalists after um, college. We. I have had to put in a lot of time and like weekends and miss classes just to like go try to find these things. I know a lot of my colleagues have um, to go knock on doors no matter what, because if you show up enough times, they'll try to tell you something. They'll say, go to the police department or um, you can kind of, uh, through showing up enough, show that you're not going to go away, I guess. Right. I think that's the biggest thing to do is just to not stop. So perseverance is key. Yeah. Let's talk just for a second about the stories that you ended up publishing, because in your stories, you actually were very transparent about the time and the resources that it took to get these um, to, to get these records and the process involved. That that seems like an interesting editorial decision. And and, you know, it is definitely part of the story. How did you decide and why did you decide to include that in your reporting? I think including the cost of what it takes to get these records serves as a public interest thing. Um, I think that without that, the public doesn't get quite as big of a grasp on what it really takes to tell these stories because this is a topic that universities and government agencies don't want out in the public. So they're gonna do whatever they can to stop it from being there. Yeah, I know I've learned that I, I get really excited about open records. I know that's like a, it might be like a journalist thing, but that a lot of my friends and other people, my peers that I talk to, 
understand what an open records request is, but they don't understand that open doesn't mean free yep. and easily accessible. So to show that, I think that we were trying to include, first of all, the money that we as an organization had to spend, as well as the time, because I think that has a lot of weight, especially with administration at universities and the students that read our, like, read the stuff that we're putting out because they see uh, that over $400 was spent to get these things like something as what seems to be as something that should be transparent to the student body, which is how their peers accusations or allegations of sexual assault are being handled. Um, and I think that that's why we included that to show what it actually takes and that open doesn't mean it's open. And this has been an ongoing problem at KU specifically, the cost that they've associated with records related to sexual assault and not related to sexual assault. So that's part of it too, is kind of trying to leave a paper trail, I guess, for the journalists that come after you to let them know that it's not just them that's struggling with the cost measures. I, I think that, that, you know, I thank you so much because I think that what you've laid out is so, first of all, it's something that so many journalists um, and student journalists across the country have to deal with. But you've laid out really where some of the struggles and some of your creative um, solutions have been in persevering and getting to the bottom of the story. Um, we want to move now. I want you guys to stand by, but to turn off your camera and mute your microphone to, um, to Mike Heaston who is SPLC's senior legal counsel. And he's gonna talk about some of the issues that um, the University of Kansas has dealt with and students across the country are dealing with in um, open records. And then Mike, you're gonna, you're gonna talk with Daniel. Right. Yes, yes. And then I'll hey. bring it back at the end. Thanks. Yeah, well, good afternoon and good morning wherever everybody, wherever everybody is. And yeah, thanks, Connor and Darby. Um, your story is, is one that you know, I'm hearing a lot of these days, as we talked about in our last uh, webinar, uh, this whole issue of access to, uh, to records dealing with campus sexual assault and uh, sexual violence is one that you know, nationally has come to the forefront and certainly on campuses, we've seen that, uh, that increase in interest as well. Um, one thing I do wanna do before we get too far along and before I get to introduce uh, our, our guest today, Daniel Carter, is I did wanna show you um, on our website, we have uh, a resource that I absolutely love and as Connor and Darby just talked about, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a resource that helps you get into uh, campus uh, crime reporting um, and all sorts of reportings when it comes to looking for using open records laws uh, as an ally to, to, uh, to doing your stories. Um, on our website, and um, we started this before anybody else did, and I'm gonna see if I can pull this up here. But on our website, if you go to our front page and you go under, so splc.org, and you go under legal help, um, if you click down and you go to the open record letter generator, uh, this was a service that we put into place back in 1997. Uh, there's a little bit of history about it there. Uh, it says it's been used more than 100,000 times to assist journalists. I know that number is way off, it's way low. Uh, this thing has been, just, just used and used and used and we're so grateful for it. Um, it is cool and it makes uh, accessing open records uh, law, uh, uh, documents and things in your state very easy. So the way you do it, I'm gonna show you how to do it real quick um, in less than a minute here. Uh, you scroll down and there's actually just a form you fill out. The only thing that there's two things you need to, to have as you go to our, uh, as you go to this record generator is you have to know the records that you're looking for and you also have to, um, have the uh, contact information for the person that you think actually holds, physically is maintaining those records. Um, once you have that, so you go to our little thing here. Hey Mike, can you yeah. make sure that you're sharing, sharing the screen? We don't actually see the screen. You don't see it, okay, let me try that again. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. How about there, can you see it there? There's something coming up. Okay. There we go. Okay. It's up. Cool. Okay, so you go to our website. Um, thanks for pointing that out. So you go to our website, go to the, to the uh, ask for legal help, and there's a link there that says uh, use our letter generator. Uh, this is the letter generator. You go through, and it's just a form you fill out. I've actually filled out some of these these. Uh, uh, 
of the, the fields here. Uh, you just need your name and, and address uh, and you need the records that you're looking for. And when you're looking for particular records, you don't actually, laws don't say that you actually have to provide like a document number uh, or a particular, a very specific record description. You just have to give the people that you're, that you're working with the actual, uh, your school district officials or whoever is holding those records. You just have to give them a, a, a reasonable description of what you're looking for. So here we're looking for records maintained by the district with respect to the fall 2017 purchase and installation of the Killer B mascot in front of Central High School. Um, that's as much uh, description as you need to provide. Um, you provide the information for the person that you think uh, holds those records. You also want to talk about how much you're willing to pay. As we talked, as Con Connor and Darby talked about, fees have become a real problem in requesting these records. So uh, we'll just say right now we're willing to pay up to ten dollars. Um, and once you've done that, you just type in create letter and voila, there it is. And what it does, it goes through and it looks, since we're looking for records from a Washington state source, it actually goes and it finds the Washington state code, it cites that, it talks about how many, how much time they have in Washington state specifically. Uh, we have five business days to respond to a request for records. Uh, the other cool thing it does, it talks about down at the bottom here, what sort of fines um, uh, are applicable if these, if uh, the people that you're looking for records from don't comply. So um, you can, you can copy and paste that, put it on fancy letterhead, make it look real pretty. Um, but once they get this, uh, once they get your, their, your letter, they have two options. They either have to provide uh, the documentation that you're looking for, or they have to, to, to point out in their uh, uh, looking at their law, they actually have to point out what is the specific exemption that they say allows them to withhold the information. They can't just say, I don't want to provide it. They actually have to point to an exemption that says, this is why I don't have to provide it. So uh, again, really simple to use. It doesn't cost a thing, at least initially. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope you we hope you take advantage of that. So now let's get to uh, the more exciting part of the day here. Um, Daniel Carter has been at the forefront of advancing campus safety and victims' rights for over 25 years. He graduated from the University of Knoxville, Tennessee in 1994 and went on to work for Safe Campuses Now uh, and then also the Clary Center for Security on Campus. While at the Clary Center, Carter created the first national program focused exclusively on providing assistance to the victims of campus violence. Through his work, Carter has helped to develop, draft, and secure passage of regulations, having served on three U.S. Department of Education negotiated rulemaking committees for seven major pieces of federal legislation, including the Federal Clary Act. Currently, Daniel is an, uh, is an independent campus security consultant and also serves on the board of the national not-for-profit not Serve Justice. In 2008, Carter was recognized on the floor of the United States House of Representatives as the leading person in the nation in advocating more action and tougher action against crimes that are committed on campus. I am just absolutely delighted to have Daniel join me now. You with us, Daniel? Mike, I'm here and it's an honor. Can you see and hear me? I gotcha. Excellent. Daniel, it's it's been a while. You and I have been doing this for about the same amount of time. You started in 1994 uh, with Clary, with the Clary Center. I started uh, with the SPLC full time in 1991, which was kind of the beginning of all this, uh, a lot of the campus crime reporting legislation that existed. Uh, I know that you have a, a fairly personal story about how you got involved in this sort of work. And I was wondering, we don't have a lot of time, but I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about your, uh, what, what, what led you to this work and, and uh, yeah. Oh, certainly. And I, I personally, again, I appreciate this opportunity. I believe student journalists have an incredibly important role to play in sharing information about campus crime and campus safety. And I first got involved uh, when, during my senior year in high school, the boyfriend of a high school classmate of mine was stabbed to death in the doorway of his fraternity house at the University of Tennessee. His name was Tommy Bear. And the murder weapon was stolen from campus police headquarters. The police report uh, on the incident was not available to the public because at that time, the Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act uh, protected those records as confidential. And when I got uh, to the University of Tennessee the next year as a student, uh, I was doing two things. I was attempting to be a photojournalist, which I ended up failing at, mm -hmm. and also began getting involved through student government 
and working in, among other things, campus safety issues. And one of our very first things that we did, and this was really where my connection between student journalism and student activism came into play, um, worked with the student government and the Daily Beacon, the student newspaper at the University of Tennessee, to actually file suit to enjoin that interpretation of FERPA. And our former president and then education secretary and current chairman in the United States Senate of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, Lamar Alexander, very promptly supported legislation to change that interpretation of FERPA. So that's how I got started. And I've been, uh, as the sign behind me points out, the campus crime records side, um, you know, the Student Press Law Center was the first national organization I ever worked with. And, it's, and you've done incredible work for going on 27 years now. That was back in 1991. That's, That's pretty, pretty, yeah. It's, time, time flies. flies. It's, amazing. it's amazing. And this <laughs> sign is hung in every office I've ever had since. Ah, well, very cool. That's quite an honor. Um, so, you know, we don't, like I said, unfortunately, I, I wish we had more time to really dig in. We could, you could talk for days. I know for that's for sure uh, on this topic. Um, but I, I think it would be helpful for those that are just kind of new to this area. Um, we, I talked uh, fairly briefly there about the use of open records laws, state open records laws, um, which is kind of the beginning of, of how a lot of student journalists get into this. But uh, there are also three other uh, federal laws that that um, seem to be fairly key to digging into to, uh, this topic. I was wondering if you could talk to us about a little bit about Clary, um, Title IX and FERPA, what exactly those laws are and what sort of information student journal journalists can look to when they, they uh, use those laws. Certainly, and as I was sort of alluding to uh, before Clary, um, campus crime and campus crime records were pretty much a black box. Um, student journalists and others simply had no access to them. So we've come a long way in the last 25 years. And the Cleary Act was first enacted in 1990 as consumer information legislation. And as the students uh, speaking earlier uh, referred to it, it's best known for reporting of campus crime statistics. Um, in addition to some timely warning and emergency notification information, which is more periodic as, as information is warranted to be sent out. Um, there's also a public crime log. So if a college or university has a police or security department, and it doesn't matter if the institution is public or private because the Clery Act applies to all schools that participate in federal student aid program funding, which is the vast majority of all colleges and universities. Um, if there's a crime reported, any crime, reported to the police or security department has to be made public in that crime log within two business days unless it would uh, endanger an investigation, cause a suspect to flee, and there's a very limited set of exceptions. Has to be a general description of what happened, has to log when it was reported, has to log when it happened, and the, the disposition, if any. For many cases, it may be under investigation. The information must be kept updated for 60 days, and the information in the crime log is it must be open for public inspection and generally doing regular business hours at a police or security department, but that does vary from time to time. And it must be archived after 60 days for upwards of seven years, sometimes longer if an institution keeps it. And that log information can be requested and must be made available within two business days of a request. Um, the Clery Act, in addition to the crime statistics, is also a wealth of information about how colleges and universities respond to crime on campus, including uh, two notable areas where the policy statements are extensive. Sexual violence, which includes sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. So it has to articulate extensively the policies and procedures that a college will follow or should follow, as well as emergency notification and response and evacuation. So it's a wealth of resources. Um, the Title IX is primarily civil rights legislation, and it, it's less focused on the disclosure of information, uh, but it too does require institutions of education that participate in federal funding to disclose to their students what their sexual harassment and discrimination policies are, by which sexual assault is considered an extreme form of hostile environment sexual harassment, who it must be reported to, things like the time frame for resolving complaints, and options for uh, filing a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights with the United States Department of Education. Uh, the, and it was enacted in 1992. Cleary was acted in, I'm sorry, Title IX, 
the timeline is this. Title IX was enacted in 1972. The Clery Act was enacted in 1990. And the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act was enacted in 1974. And it's generally known for protecting the confidentiality of student educational records, but there are certain key exceptions that can be used. One of the most notable, and this was added in 1998, is that if a student is found responsible for violating school rules in connection with an alleged crime of violence, which does include sexual assault, the final results of that disciplinary proceeding are not part of their confidential educational records and may be disclosed without their written consent. It's a, it's a very, uh, not very well known exception to FERPA. There's also health, a health and safety exception. And also of interest is that students have a right to request access to their own records. And in fact, the Student yeah. Press Law Center has a FERPA uh, records request generator as well, in addition to the public records request generator. And one thing you know, I would definitely encourage students to do, as uh, student journalists, is when they're cultivating sources, is to you know let students know that if they've been through one of these proceedings, they have a right to access the education records uh, from it. Now, yes. some of them may be restricted for in terms of public disclosure, uh, but the final, res you know, a victim in a crime of violence uh, has access to their outcome. Uh, in cases of sexual assault and sexual violence, they have an absolute right to redisclose that information to student journalists if they so choose. So there are options that reporters can use to get access to that information. And and I think that brings up a good point um, in terms of FERPA doesn't, uh, it does provide access to uh, your own campus or your own uh, uh, education records. Um, it, it's not a mechanism in itself for getting getting access to, uh, for example, the, the final results of a disciplinary proceeding, like a campus court proceeding. Um, for that, you would have to use your your state open records law or something like that, or state open meetings law to, to, to get access to that sort of information. Um, the uh, so when we're talking about uh, uh, Title IX and Clary, I mean Title IX is kind of new to the game. I mean, typically, uh, what I'd always advised people is when they're looking for information on campus crime, um, if you're at a public school, first start with some of your your, your general public records sorts of requests, working with the police. Um, in addition to what's provided by Clary, because Clary provides kind of a, a, a floor of information uh, that schools have to provide. They, if you're at a public school, they additionally have to provide that required by their public records laws, I guess, as well. Um, when you're at a, a private school and your only access to, uh, uh, to these records is Clary, um, what has been your experience in terms of schools being in compliance? I mean, the records that, uh, that that's the, the information that schools are reporting, uh, are schools doing a good job in terms of, of actually reporting good information and disclosing that information to students? Well, I mean, even after 20 plus years, the answer to that question is it, it still varies significantly right. in terms of the quality of information um, that, schools disclose and oftentimes what you'll see is if student journalists raise the questions and there it becomes an issue the oftentimes the process is fixed perpetually so you can have reporting on the fact that information that under the clear act you're entitled to is not being made readily available and oftentimes that in and of itself can get that information available right. and it continues to be available thereafter so and there are pen there are penalties. I mean, if schools don't don't do their job under Clary, uh, there there are there are some teeth to this law. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that and what students students should do if they think that their schools uh, aren't being fully open. The, well, the, the one caution I have about Clary Act enforcement in terms of a journalistic tool is that when the United States Department of Education and they have a, a unit called the Clary Act Compliant, Compliance mm -hmm. Division. And they can be reached at clery at ed.gov or clerycomplaint at ed.gov. And again, that's the Clery Act Compliance Division. Is when they open a formal program review, and that's the name of an official investigation, can run anywhere from two to five years. So if you're trying to report in a timely manner on incidents and your rep report to the Department of Education that you can't get access, um, 
they may resolve the case and there may be fines upwards of almost $55,000 per violation. So as Mike said, there is teeth, but you may not get it quickly. Uh, that's one of the reasons I would encourage student journalists to research the law, report on what isn't being disclosed, talk about the fines or civil penalties as they're officially called, and, and try to encourage their institution to be more transparent. That's a faster process. And if that doesn't work, yes, go to the Department of Education. And I know sometimes there's an ethical question about filing a complaint under the Clery Act, but in this instance, it's no different than going to a state arbiter of public records request, because you're entitled to this information. If you're not getting it, the official arbiter is the United States Department of Education. And, f and one piece of good news recently is they have initiated what appears to be a more rapid resolution process uh, for some cases where they're not conducting two to five year reviews. They're mm. closing cases relatively quickly, admonishing schools to comply. So there may be a new faster option. We've seen about a dozen or so cases of it this year. And, and I think that's encouraging because there's an option for student journalists to go to the Department of Education, say we're not getting these records and perhaps get a quick turnaround that doesn't involve a full on investigation and get access to that information that they deserve. That's that's wonderful because that, that has been a huge problem. Just the, uh, the the length of time that it takes, you know, students graduate and um, these cases uh, tend to disappear sometimes. Uh, one of the other things I want to talk about uh, back to, to Title IX because this this is a little bit of a new uh, sort of tool that students are using. Um, so when schools uh, are when when somebody comes to the school and, and reports one of these incidents, they open an investigation typically. Um, now my for the most part, I found that those those investigation records uh, being conducted by a school uh, typically those are not available. Uh, to, to students or to, to others that are interested. Um, but you talked about kind of the backdoor approach, um, which is going through the student themselves, the student that's actually uh, involved in the process. Um, have you had good success with that? I mean, like you say, the, the, these records, uh, under FERPA at least, they're, they're part of the student's education records and required to be disclosed. Does Title IX also require disclosure to victim? Um. Title IX essentially does if it applies directly to the student, uh, but Cleary definitely provides more authoritative access for a victim, or both the accuser and the accused are entitled to that outcome. Um, but many of the underlying records from the proceeding may still remain protected as confidential education records under FERPA unless all of the students who are identified sign off in writing to have mm -hmm. that information disclosed. So, you know, you can get the final results from either the accused or the accused or both potentially, but they're free to talk about their own firsthand personal experience. So cultivating uh, both survivors and the accused as sources mm -hmm. to talk about their experience is an essential element of reporting on these types of cases and doing it sensitively. That's something that I can't mm -hmm. underestimate the importance of. Um, you know, this is a, it's a trying process, it's traumatic, and understanding how that will affect um, how students talk about it is essential. Uh, but that is one important resource, and, and in, in recent years, more and more survivors, and even some accused, have been willing to share their story publicly, uh, because they feel that they have not gotten the justice that they deserve. So particularly if they've done something like file litigation, you may be able to go to an attorney, and get them to discuss it. And one thing about cases where there have been, has been litigation filed, oftentimes discovery will reveal a treasure trove mm -hmm. uh, of case documents if you're willing to go in and do the investigating uh, of those documents. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is this is tough reporting. This is information that schools typically are not uh, real happy to be sharing. And so, like you say, developing developing sources outside of the school, talking with uh, talking with victims, talking with those that have been through the system, um, is 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 absolutely key. And one of the things, I mean, that 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 I think both of us have seen is that, gosh, where where journalists are successful in in kind of getting behind the closed doors of these uh, campus disciplinary systems. Um, there is, there's a lot of eye-opening stuff that comes out. Um, you know, there is a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of contention on the part of both victims and um, those accused that this might not be these places might not be the best place to actually conduct these sorts of these sorts of hearings. Um, you know, uh, we're running out of time here. And like I said, we should, I wish we'd had a little bit, we'd schedule a little bit more time and maybe we'll do that in the future, just a longer sort of session about this. But do you have any um, other particular tips? I mean, cul cultivating, uh, you know, relationships with those involved in the system, um, I know is a big one. Any other particular tips for reporters when they're, when they're trying to, like Darby and Connor, as they're trying to, to dig into this, uh, into this topic and, and, and cover what's happening? Well, certainly cultivating sources, and that includes within the administration, that includes within the campus police or security department, as well as students who may have been involved who may want to tell their story. And also understanding when not to push too hard and understanding that there are restraints under the law that the schools have that sometimes when they're denying you access to information, that is something that is legitimately protected under federal and or state law and understanding what those constraints are so that there's you can actually work productively to get the information that you can get. Um, you know, those are some of the things I would encourage strongly and also trying to institutionalize um, the relationships in the process so that it's not dependent solely on a police beat or student conduct beat reporter who has the job for one semester. Mm -hmm. Someone else comes in the next semester or the next year, no experience, you know, pass on some notes, have some orientation do some introductions. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges in student media. There's a loss of institutional memory. The institution has it, but the student journalists don't have it. So finding a way to pass that on is very, very important, uh, I think, in terms of making sure that there's, you know, if you build up a good relationship and a good reporting program, take steps to continue it, pass it on, so that it's not dependent upon the individual beat reporter on their own to just figure it all out again. That's such a great point. Yeah, I mean that that is one of the things we consistently battle against. I mean, Connor and and, and Darby mentioned that you know that they're uh, when they're trying to get access to some of these records, the school is trying to outlast them. They know that they're going to graduate and disappear. So, uh, letting them know that that the players might change, but the the interest in this issue continues. I think that's 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 great advice. Um, so I was going to kind of plug um, in terms of people getting more information about specifically Clary and, uh, uh, you know, public records laws in their states uh, when they're trying to dig into campus crime reporting. Uh, our resource, we have a, a resource that's called Covering Campus Crime. It's available for a free download on our website. Uh, some of the laws here, as, as Daniel's talked about, um, you know, they, they can get a little bit complicated, um, but there's some really good, um, important information that's available thanks to, to work by people like Daniel and getting some of this legislation passed. Daniel, do you have any other particular resources that you think are really good for, for students? Um, people can call me. People can call you. Excellent. Did you want to provide a, some contact information? Um, sure. Actually, that's actually not a bad idea. I want to make sure I give out the right number. Um, the best number to reach me at is, I don't know if people can see it, it's area code 202-684-6471. So that's area code 202-684-6471. And, you know, I bet I, I, I don't know all the fancy stuff you can do with this, but I think Danielle has a way to uh, post that information along with uh, with our video when it's when it's up there. So, um, Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, I wish we had more time. You've got so much information and uh, and we will schedule something in the future. So, Mike, always a pleasure. Thank you for all having right. me. All right. Thank you. Hadar. Great. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Daniel. We we are getting to the end of our time, but clearly this is complicated stuff. We have lots of resources available. We have lots of uh, who can help. So not only taking Daniel up on his, his offer to get in touch with him, but you can also always get in touch with us at SPLC through the SPLC website, making an appointment to talk to Mike on the hotline, bring your questions forward to us. Um, I want to thank everyone who's participated in today's webinar. I also want to note that there are lots of resources that are available, um, including the articles that we talked about from Kansas um, uh, at the beginning of our, our webinar today. 
um, that are posted in the description box along with this webinar today. So this is complicated stuff. There are lots of resources. There are lots of people who can answer questions. There are lots of resources available on our website as well. Um, and this continue. This conversation will continue. I want to say a very special thank you to Danielle Dietrich, who is SPLC's journalism fellow. Very hard work in putting together today's webinar, um, and in all that she does and does so well. To Diana to Klaus, um, our director of engagement, for her support in putting this together. Um, and to all of our guests today, please look forward to more webinars coming up in the new year. If you have ideas for topics that you would like us to discuss, or if you know people watching this webinar, this webinar is posted on the SPLC uh, YouTube channel. You can distribute that. You can send us your ideas for other topics that you'd like to see us address in the future. Thank you all for joining us. Please be sure to follow SPLC on Twitter at SPLC, on Facebook, and bookmark the SPLC.org website for a whole bunch of different resources. Thank you all again for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. All the best.